pythons, both threatening and fascinating. Their leather is extremely sought after. As a luxury product in the world of fashion. Behind the scenes, an industry that is almost uncontrollable. We can't check whether these snakes were caught illegally or not. Opaque business deals to the detriment of the environment. Could a genetic fingerprint protect these snakes? Pythons are native to Africa, Asia and Australia. They're not venomous. They're the longest reptiles in the world. Depending on the species, they lay between two and a hundred eggs in their nest, which they will aggressively defend. Reticulated pythons are particularly popular. The catch quotas are increasing. In some areas of Malaysia, the population nevertheless seems stable. In other areas, this species has become rare. There's no controlling body, but that's exactly what this German biologist is fighting for. Reticulated pythons are among the most surprising and brilliant reptiles there are. My dream is that my studies and others could ensure that pythons and their habitat are protected for the long term. Mark Aulia travels all around the world to protect pythons. Malaysia is a current problem area. Even though the country is not allowed to export snake skins to the EU, clearly they still find their way into Europe illegally. Telek Untan, a town in the middle of the country, is believed to be a stronghold of the snake trade. Mark Aulia is an internationally recognized reptile expert, which doesn't make him popular everywhere. But today's snake catchers haven't heard of him. They're happy to take him hunting. They head into the palm oil plantations. The hunters allow us to join them. Their traps are in the water-filled ditches. They're not always successful. Their goal is to trick the pythons into getting trapped in these nets. The snakes like gliding through these ditches at night. This python here has destroyed the trap. They check 20 nets every day. These men have a license. On good days, they catch one or two animals. Mark Aulia isn't the sort of biologist who's happy to sit in an office. He wants to be out in the field to learn from the hunters and understand their problems. <laughs> to achieve that, he gives his all. The snake is one big muscle. It's not venomous, but it can crush its victims and stop them breathing. Just recently, a plantation worker died in this manner. This snake looks like it's been trapped in the net for several hours. Once properly grabbed, the exhausted python lacks the strength to defend itself. Okay, We've just caught a reticulated python. It's one of the larger specimens. 
It's three and a half metres long and it got trapped in one of these nets that has a mesh of two to four centimetres. They're very proud because this one's really valuable. If you overlook the head and it bites you, it gets a good grip on you and then you're in trouble. Especially if you're alone. The snake can wind itself around you and that's a serious problem. 25 euros per snake. That's a lot of money for these men. Money they can use to feed their families. These reptiles are a commodity. Species conservation is a foreign concept to them. The majority of python snake skins come from Indonesia and Malaysia. Legal goods from Indonesia are shipped to the EU via ports such as Singapore. Germany is a particularly frequent arrival destination. After that, they go to Europe's fashion capitals. This route isn't officially open to python leather from Malaysia. The Federal Agency for Nature Conservation is responsible for import permits. There are countries that are allowed to export to Germany, while others aren't. That's because when it comes to animals taken from the wild, we have to check whether they were taken in a sustainable manner. Indonesia voluntarily announced quotas that have been internationally accepted, including by the EU. Other countries haven't announced quotas. We have no data. That's why these countries, Malaysia, Laos and Cambodia, aren't given a permit. Final stop, the fashion world. The snake leather is turned into exclusive ladies' handbags or into expensive men's boots. Processed in Milan or Paris, the 25 euros for the snake become a luxury item often worth several thousand euros. Hamburg Airport. Every year, tens of thousands of snake skins go through customs. Every one is a dead animal. There are 2,000 today. The snake skins originally come from Indonesia. They come here via Singapore. We have the export permit numbers from Indonesia and Singapore. That matches with the import permits from Germany from the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. We have 2,000 snake skins weighing 600 kilos. The total value of this shipment is around 200,000 euros. We have to be careful not to damage the goods. You can see the scales here very well. It's clearly a snake. But what snake exactly? The customs officer has to rely on the papers. The majority of the skins for Europe are imported via Germany. The reasons for that are speculative. It could be because the logistics work relatively well here, because we're experienced. So they have good experiences with us, they don't have to try out other places. The German bureaucracy, apparently it's appreciated in Asia. The customs office knows many of the European middlemen. They've been using Hamburg as an entry port for years. We're not able to tell whether these snakes were caught illegally. We can only check the papers. We look for signs that these skins have come from a different country. We look at how they were transported. If there's anything suspicious, we investigate further. The officers can't rule out that illegal snake skins have been mixed in with the legal ones. It's impossible to determine the countries of origin exactly. A simple X-ray won't provide answers, but a scanner that checks the genetic material could be a possible alternative. Today's shipment gets the bureaucratic thumbs up. Edinburgh in Scotland. Mark Aulia is looking for methods that would allow customs officers to determine the countries of origin better. It's a project he's doing with the Royal Zoological Society. Edinburgh has one of the three top laboratories in Europe for the examination of genetic samples. 
When it comes to species conservation, it's important to me that the commercial trade in reticulated python skins is regulated better so that the populations can be properly protected. So Mark approached us to, um, to, to see if we could use DNA to actually work out where something comes from. And DNA can be a very powerful tool in identifying population of origin, not just a species, but actually within the species group, which country it came from. Skin samples from pythons from all over Asia are divided up. Every single one is matched to where it was caught. The unmistakable DNA pattern reveals the origin. This is how they want to decipher the python coat. The best solution for me would be that all the controlling authorities along the way in the importing and exporting countries could do scan checks that would tell them whether they're dealing with legal or illegal goods. We're back in Malaysia. To achieve his goal, Mark Aulia needs several python skin samples. It's a tough job. Success today comes via a phone call, not a search. The snake catchers have put him in touch with a dealer. That's unusual because they don't tend to let anyone see their hand. Our trip takes us to an industrial area. Okay, it should be just over there. There's a warehouse in between motorbike shops and television retailers. Soon, Heng lets Mark Aulia take a look. He's a friendly man and a millionaire, as we later find out. As a tanner, this is where he gets his goods from. There are 60,000 python skins in this room, all of the best quality. Mark Aulia has never seen such a big warehouse before. The skins here are worth more than 6 million euros. The employee's proud, the skin of an enormous python. Even the biologist, who's horrified at the sight of the many dead snakes, is clearly impressed. This is a very wide reticulated python skin, 6 meters 30. The tail is missing and the head is missing, along with a piece of the neck, so probably 6 meters 60, 6 meters 70. Every single skin is checked by an expert. This one gets through up to a thousand a day. Bite marks reduce the price. They talk shop about the quality. There isn't always agreement. Snakes destined for export tend to have a length of three meters and a width of 30 centimeters. Everything's recorded and the total price of individual batches calculated. Mark Aulia learns that the majority of the skins here are sent to Singapore and Japan. Soon, Heng is trusting. He wants to show the German his tannery. It's the largest of its kind in Malaysia. Tan skins are dried on long slats here. Everything is done by hand. Most of the 50 employees live in the factory. Their accommodation is in the attic. The way these skins have been processed is similar to that of the leather we saw at Hamburg Customs. Ironing the skins gives them a sheen. Okay. 
The skins in this drum are to be bleached or dyed in different colors chosen by the clients. That ranges from white to yellow to black and everything in between. Much here seems old fashioned. There are no European workers' protection standards. This machine, weighing two tons, races closely past these fingertips. The dyes are toxic. A lot of chemicals are needed to create a permanent bond between the dye and the leather during this process. Mark Aulia won't let any opportunity pass him by. Whenever it's known where a snake was caught, he takes a sample. He gathers them in envelopes and can later import them into Germany with an official permit. That's necessary even for a tiny bit of snakeskin. Pythons are a protected species. But the more the skins have been treated, the harder it will be to attribute them later in the lab. Yeah, very, very interesting. Most pythons in Malaysia live in the palm oil plantations, where they fulfill an important ecological role. They eat rats. The decline in the python population has dramatic consequences for the plantation owners. The rats multiply and destroy the harvest. You can see rat bite marks here. Rats only ever eat the top, then they're full. While the plantation owners complain, the rural population are glad about the decline in pythons. Mark Aulia chats to a teacher. He and his family are scared of pythons. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, okay. Um, he says that snakes are very dangerous in Malay tradition. That's why they keep their distance and want to protect their children. A child would indeed be easy prey for a python. There are many legends of murderous giant snakes that become particularly active during the monsoon season. There are two or three examples in literature of pythons swallowing up people. No more than that. So it's not really a danger. The teacher doesn't seem convinced. He's apparently seen veritable monsters in his village. Oh, really? It's very big. If I can see from here. Okay, okay. He just said that the largest python he's ever seen was in a tree around 100 meters away. He said it was around 15 meters long. That was around 15 years ago. Very exciting, but just an estimate. Estimate. It's a schätzung. It's a schätzung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Truth is relative during the monsoon rains. Mark becomes thoughtful this evening. There's a trip to a slaughterhouse planned for tomorrow. It's apparently somewhere here, hidden in a palm oil plantation. It's the largest python slaughterhouse in the region.
Mark Aulia got this contact from the Tanner. He doesn't know whether he'll be welcome. The mood is tense. Lau Big Hawk is well known in the Python business. His family has been making money this way for decades. It's not just snakes that are killed for fashion here. This slaughterhouse processes countless monitor lizards as well. The animals await their end in a concrete basin. The conditions are unacceptable from a European perspective. The sacks contain live pythons. The men who delivered them received around 25 euros in cash in return. Mark Aulia is uncomfortable. He doesn't want to show his empathy for the living snakes. He becomes an unwilling participant. He plays a role. The animal is dead in seconds. Onlookers are appalled when they see how these reticulated pythons are beheaded. At the same time, millions of chickens are beheaded in Germany. But chickens aren't wild animals. These pythons are, and that's the problem. 25 pythons are killed this afternoon. The bodies convulse for up to two hours after being beheaded. Animals that had a purpose in the ecosystem. Because the number of inexpensive wild animals is in decline, the butcher has become a breeder. He proudly shows off his farm to Mark Aulia. There's a python in every crack. These pythons were caught in the wild. He wants them to reproduce here under difficult conditions, but so far to no avail. Farmed animals would be easier to sell on the international market, but they're more expensive because of the tricky farming conditions. The beheaded pythons are hung on a hook to allow their blood to drain. It's unbearable for the biologist. I'm definitely suffering. I don't know how I get through this situation, but collecting data allows us to change something in the end. The snakes are pumped full of water because that makes it easier to detach the skin from the flesh. Other slaughterhouses use compressed air, sometimes when the snakes are still alive. It's hard work for the laborers. They tend to come from neighboring countries and earn a pittance. Finally, the skins are stretched out to dry. Very hot. The butcher's creative. He'd like to bring his own collection onto the market. He's already implemented some initial ideas. You can't argue about taste. He's even had a python waistcoat tailor-made for him. We want to know what happens to the reptile's meat. We visit the neighboring village. A local takes us to the village butchers. It sells wild pig from the region. Python, we're told, is only available at the weekend. Next door, a neighbor kills a monitor lizard.
the skin and meat are sold. Next day. Ach, da ist er. Ja, dann gehe ich mal raus. Mark Aulia has agreed to meet the man from the slaughterhouse again. He wants to know whether he sends his snake skins to Europe. He was tense yesterday, but today Lau Big Hock is more relaxed. He reveals more to Mark about the trade routes to Europe. During the conversation, one of the scientists' hunches is confirmed. The dealer doesn't just sell to Asia, but also to Turkey. He hands out addresses. My hunch is very serious. For 10 years now, skins from Malaysia have been banned by the European Union. The dealers export to Turkey. In Turkey then, these skins are labelled as having come from Indonesia, and then they're exported to the EU. Mark Aulia wants to know for sure. He claims to be a buyer on the phone. He wants to know if dealers in Istanbul are willing to send illegal goods from Malaysia to Germany. Where do you get them from then? From Indonesia or Malaysia. Do you sell them to Germany? Yes, of course. And you could make me an offer for like 5,000 skins from Malaysia? Could you do that? Yes. Juan, I can send you color card and you can see the color. A different trader has the same reaction. Can you uh, send some skins from Malaysia to Germany? He said, yeah, he can. You would send Malaysian skins mixed with Indonesian skins. If you want it mixed, yeah, you can do that. Okay, okay, great. The result, three of the four traders had no scruples. Trading with illegal skins is not a problem for them. A route into the EU. As long as customs officers only check papers, this remains an undetectable problem. The solution could lie in the Python code, identifying skins by their DNA. Mark Aulia's search for samples has brought about progress. We've achieved a breakthrough. We were able to show with this pioneering study that we can trace samples back to their place of origin. That's the main goal of this study. The more samples we can get, the more locations we can determine. That's a fantastic and crucial goal of our study. It could be years before customs officers get scanners. Maybe luxury customers will have a simple insight. There's something more beautiful than a python leather handbag. And that's a living python.